Well, uh, thank you very much and good uh, afternoon for you. Good morning for me. Um, um, it is a great pleasure to, to give this webinar, um, taking advantage of the pandemic situation. Now, uh, I believe it's easier to, to do this uh, kind of uh, lectures from one continent to a different continent. So um, I'm very appreciative of the uh, invitation. Thank you, Thomas, for, for inviting me. And uh, I will try to do my best to cover this uh, topic that uh, I thought it could be interesting for you, which is noise control in concrete buildings uh, using floating floor technologies. Um, Well, the outline of my presentation is uh, as follows. Uh, first, I will give a brief introduction uh, about the problem of impact noise in buildings, uh, then how to measure uh, insulation, and I will go into the main standards. Then I um, will say a few things about the noise control of impact noise, um, what are floating floors, and I will uh, discuss uh, about viscoelastic underlayments. Um, then I will uh, discuss the physical modeling of the problem. And then finally, I will finish with uh, showing you some recent research we have done in our lab, uh, which is uh, um, a research about nanostructured uh, layers and then uh, about the thin laminate floors. All right, uh, let, me, let me move this. I'm sorry, I have a technical problem here. No, it's all right. Thanks. All right, uh, well, we have to discuss about uh, concrete uh, uh, buildings, which are a fundamental part of modern societies and uh, reinforced concrete is one of the main materials used in industrialized uh, countries. Uh, important characteristic of concrete buildings is uh, that they are also strong, but uh, flexible and can be structurally de designed to overcome large stresses, uh, such as strong winds and earthquakes, which is uh, quite important in my country. Um, concrete buildings are also designed for several uses, uh, such as houses, multifamily apartments, and uh, also industrial uh, buildings. Well, interior noise is uh, currently a competitive quality characteristic of modern apartment buildings. Um, even lack of noise insulation in a building usually causes a reduction in the selling price of uh, an apartment. Uh, in this figure, uh, we can see that buildings are very complex mechanical structures and are subjected to many external and internal sources of noise and vibration. Um, the requirement of lightweight construction in new buildings uh, have made these buildings more susceptible to noise and vibration related problems. Thus, uh, occupants frequently complain about the levels of noise and vibration they experience. Uh, internal sources of noise vibration in buildings are mechanical equipments um, such as roof mounted heating, ventilation and air conditioning units, uh, the boilers and elevators, um, but we also have home appliances, uh, discharge pipes, etc. Uh, the building occupants themselves produce noise in many ways. Uh, for example, speaking with loud voices, uh, hearing loud music or loud TV, um, moving furniture and their footsteps. Um, in addition, sound, sound transmission is of concern in many different noise uh, problems. Although the transmission of sound through walls of buildings is uh, the topic which uh, seems to have received the most uh, attention. This is not surprising because um, in buildings, we are mainly concerned with uh, reducing the sound transmitted from one room to another. 
Um, however, uh, with the continued mechanization of transportation and other equipment, uh, we are becoming more and more concerned with keeping exterior noise out of buildings. This is what we call uh, usually the emission, uh, for example, from uh, surface uh, transportation vehicles, mainly road and rail traffics, but also we have to include aircraft noise and industrial noise. Well, two types of sound transmission can be considered in a building. Um, airborne sound transmission and structure-borne sound transmission. Um, airborne sound transmission is uh, sound that travels through the air. Uh, this is the most common problem found in buildings and a large amount of research has been presented in the literature on this topic. Uh, we will not discuss this type of sound transmission here anyway. Uh, on the other hand, a structure-borne sound is defined as sound that is carried uh, via the structure of a building. Uh, however, we know that airborne and structure-borne sound are intrinsically uh, linked. Uh, a sound wave that travels through a building results in the sound radiation of uh, a structural element, uh, such as a concrete slab. Example. This radiation can be very efficient sometimes, uh, resulting in annoyance to residents in a building. Uh, we will focus the discussion on impact noise. Um, impact noise is the major sound transmission problem in concrete buildings, and its solution and prediction have concerned researchers for many years. Uh, impact sound is uh, a special kind of structure bone sound. Uh, this type of noise severely affects people's quality of lives and annoys building residents. <clears throat> there are several sources of impact sound in buildings, but uh, footsteps are considered the main ones. Um, a difficulty in the investigation of impact noise um, is that the noise sources are impulsive in nature, and this causes problems with measurement procedures designed to measure a steady state or continuous noises. Well, um, the use of an impact machine to simulate footsteps, which is the main uh, source of uh, impact noise in a building, uh, was introduced by Reher in, in 1932. Uh, improvements to Reher uh, earlier tapping machine have been incorporated in international standards for laboratory and field measurements of impact sound insulation of floors. For, for example, the part five or the ISO standard 10140. Uh, since the force spectrum of the standardized tapping machine is uh, dominated by higher frequencies, uh, international standards for measuring impact sound uh, isolation include a modified tapping machine and um, a standardized rubber ball as uh, alternative sources to the ISO tapping machine. <clears throat> For many years, tires and rubber balls um, have been used as low frequency impact noise sources in Japan and Korea to simulate children jumping and running in apartment buildings. Uh, they prioritize uh, the frequencies between 50 and 630 hertz in one third octave bands. Um, uh, in this figure, I show the CESFA uh, tapping machine, which is the, the one we have in, in our lab. Well, a standardized laboratory comprises two vertical transmission rooms, uh, which are separated by a 140 millimeter um, standard reinforced concrete slab. Um, the details are given in, in part three of the standard 10140. Laboratory test uh, methods also require highly diffuse sound fields and, and the suppression of uh, flanking sound transmission in the receiving room of the laboratory. With the tapping machine source placed on the floor under test in different positions, uh, the space average sound pressure levels are measured in the receiving room located below the floor specimen. Some pressure level measurements are conducted in one third of the bands in the range of uh, 100 uh, to 5,000 Hertz, uh, according to the ISO standard. 
the American standard, which is the ASTM, uh, it covers the range of 100 up to 3,150. Uh, but it's the different um, uh, standard. We usually use the ISO standard uh, all over the world. After applying a corrective term, that depends on the measure equivalent sound absorption area of the receiving room, uh, normalized impact sound pressure level at uh, each frequency band is calculated. This is the, the correction term uh, where A naught is the referent absorption area, which is defined as 10 uh, savings. Well, to compare different floor constructions, uh, it is often convenient to use a single number rating instead of the normalized impact sound pressure level, which uh, varies with frequency, of course. So methods of rating the impact sound transmission of floor structures involve comparing the measured normalized sound pressure levels in the receiving room against a standard contour. Um, which are described in part two of uh, the standard ISO 717. In this figure, we can see an example of laboratory measurements for three cases, a, a bare concrete slab, a joist floor, and a concrete slab with a floating floor. The curves in, in red and in green indicate the standard contours. The procedure yields a single number rating a term, the weighted normalized impact sound pressure, um, LNW. Um, the ISO standard also suggests the use of a uh, spectrum adaptation term uh, to deal with low frequency noise. Um, thus floor structures with lower values of LNW transmit less impact noise. Using the normalized impact uh, sound pressure levels of um, um, between 100 and 3,150 hertz of a heavy reference floor, which has uh, um, L and W of 78 decibels. Uh, the section five of uh, the ISO standard also describes a procedure to evaluate the weighted reduction in impact sound pressure level, which is called Delta LW, achieved by floor covering some bare heavy floors. Um, this single number quantity is useful to obtain comparable values between laboratories. Um, also recommended criteria for impact noise insulation have been presented in several countries, um, usually as building technical codes. Um, some building technical codes include constructional details and recommend floor ceiling assemblies that are known to satisfy the corresponding building code and uh, they have also been checked in recognized laboratories. Well, uh, concrete floors are usually very heavy. And we know that and can provide high insulation to airborne sound, but they are usually poor insulators of impact sound. Uh, so in practice, um, increasing the thickness of a concrete slab to reduce impact sound is not uh, economically viable. Uh, viable, sorry. Uh, the impact insulation uh, of a concrete floor can uh, usually be improved if the floor is vibration isolated in some way. Um, this can be done rather easily by installing a soft resilient layer on the surface, such as uh, rubber-like materials or a carpet with an underlay. Um, but uh, while the use of resilient materials can improve the impact noise insulation of the floor uh, considerably, uh, it has very little effect on airborne sound transmission uh, loss. Uh, if impact noise must be reduced even further, uh, consideration should be given to the use of a floating floor construction, um, um, where the floating floor up layer can be supported by an isolated uh, from the structural slab using an array of uh, resilient pads or a continuous uh, resilient layer applied to the structural slab. Um, now I'm going to discuss this uh, uh, latter form of uh, noise control. Well, the figure shows a simple representation of a floating floor. Uh, the floating floor can be physically described as a single degree of freedom system uh, in which the mass is associated to the upper layer and the spring uh, to the underlayment. 
Uh, therefore, um, a floating floor has a fundamental natural frequency that is determined by the mass per unit area of the floating slab and the total dynamic stiffness per unit area uh, of the resilient support. Um, well, here we have uh, S is the dynamic stiffness and rho S is, uh, of course, the um, mass uh, per unit area of the floating uh, slab. Um, the latter consists of the dynamic uh, stiffness per unit area of the material and that of the enclosed air, which includes uh, the effect of airflow resistivity, for example. Uh, for the floating floor structure to have good subjectively perceived impact sound insulation, the natural frequency, this F naught, uh, should be as low as possible. Um, we know that uh, the natural frequency can be reduced by um, uh, either increasing the mass or decreasing the dynamic stiffness. Um, however, increasing the mass is usually limited by structural or, or economical reasons. So dynamical stiffness becomes the most important parameter for design. Experimental evidence has shown that uh, dynamic stiffness is closely related to impact sound insulation. This uh, allows uh, theoretical estimation of the impact noise insulation of the floating floor structure in terms of the load to which it will be subjected, knowing only the value of uh, its dynamic stiffness. Um, in order to include the effect of the mass of an homogeneous resilient layer, uh, this term uh, one third of rho L may be added to the mass per unit surface of the floating floor upper layer, uh, where rho L is um, the mass per unit area of the resilient layer. Uh, this comes from the theory of uh, mass um, spring. Um, as the fundamental natural frequency of the floating floor can be calculated uh, using this uh, new equation. Well, it has to be noted that, uh, as strictly speaking, an underlayment layer behaves as a viscoelastic material. Uh, that's to say a material that exhibits both viscous and elastic characteristics uh, simultaneously when undergoing deformation. Uh, the viscoelastic properties of the underlayment material uh, above uh, heavyweight base structural slab are characterized by a spring and a damper in parallel in the sense of a kelvin boyd uh, model. Consequently, uh, the stiffness and damping of the resilient layer can be combined into a single uh, complex stiffness per unit area, this S bar, where S is the dynamic stiffness per unit area and uh, eta is the internal damping loss factor of the material. Um, in addition, the material can also behave uh, either as a linear or non-linear material when deformed by uh, an oscillatory force. Well, the dynamic stiffness of an underlayment can be measured following the recommendation ISO uh, 9052. Uh, in this uh, standardized procedure, uh, a 200 millimeters times 200 millimeter sample, so in a square sample of each underlayment is placed between a steel load uh, plate and a motionless rigid, rigid foundation. Uh, the mass of the steel plate of the same dimensions as the sample is uh, approximately eight kilograms, which corresponds to a static load of two kilopascals. Uh, the plate is excited by a dynamic input uh, force applied by, an, in this case, by an electrodynamic shaker. And the force signal is measured by a force transducer. And the vertical vibration of the load plate is measured by a piezoelectric uh, accelerometer, a position close to the excitation point. Um, after signal processing in the frequency domain, the resonance uh, frequency is determined from the accelerance transfer function. So we can determine the peak of the resonance frequency from here. But uh, also uh, we can um, obtain the damping loss factor uh, based on the half power point points method uh, in which the three decibels uh, down points from the maximum peak amplitude 
define the corresponding half power band with delta F. Um, so we can determine the uh, damping loss factor from this uh, simple equation. Um, since its introduction, there has been considerable debate about the correct determination of the dynamic steamness uh, of different types of resilient supports. Um, this is because the ISO standard may not apply to loads less than 400 pascals, and the standard does not consider the potential effects of preload uh, time, long-term deformation, the creep, and compressibility of the material under test. However, the ISO standards, uh, standard is widely used to routinely uh, characterize the dynamic stiffness of an underlayment uh, used to reduce impact noise in buildings. Um, even so, in some local legislation, I remember that in the legislation of Korea, the values of dynamic stiffness of resilient material use in apartment floors uh, have been limited to 40 mega newtons per cubic meter. Uh, well, let's say a few things about the physical modeling. Um, first of all, Gossel in 1949 introduced uh, what is called today the improvement in impact sound insulation, delta L. Um, Remember that we measured this LN uh, in laboratory, but we have now a new quantity LN naught. Um, this is defined by this uh, equation. It represents a comparison between um, the normalized impact sound pressure level measured with and without the floating floor on the concrete uh, slab. It can be shown that when a force is applied to the floating slab, um, a force is transmitted to the structural slab. This transmitted force is the sum of the elastic and a dissipation forces acting on the slab. Uh, the transmitted force is also out of phase with the exciting force, uh, but it is simple to obtain the ratio of the amplitude of the forces in the steady state, and that is known as the force uh, transmissibility. Um, using this idea, uh, Alessandro Chiavi in Italy started this so stated the so-called constitutive relation for uh, delta L of uh, locally reacting floor, which is given by this equation, uh, where uh, she is uh, the ratio between the external forcing frequency um, and the natural frequency of the floating floor. If the floor is resonantly reacting uh, to fit the empirical uh, model proposed by Kremer, uh, which, which well, it, that was the first uh, model uh, to, to be proposed, the constant multiplying factor 10 uh, must be replaced by 7.5. Um, in that way, the isolation of such a floating floor increases at the rate of 30 decibels uh, for each decade uh, increase in frequency. Well, this constitutive relation has been proven to predict well uh, the delta L of most practical cases of uh, relatively heavy and undamped uh, floating slabs, um, knowing the dynamic stiffness of the underlayment uh, when it is measured according to the ISO standard. Well, now uh, I will show you um, two recent investigation conducted in our lab. Uh, the first one is the development of a nanostructure viscoelastic layer, uh, which uh, was published in the journal Applied Acoustics. Um, the main objective is to produce a polymer composite uh, filled with the nanoclay, uh, in this case, laponite, uh, in different proportions to achieve a lower uh, dynamic stiffness. The use and production of polymer composites uh, have received much attention in recent years. Uh, we know that new advances in mixing polymers and nanomaterials have proven to be an effective way to optimize the microscopic mechanical properties of the resulting composites uh, for uh, different technical applications. Um, uh, polymer composites are fabricated by combining a polymer matrix and um, and synthetic or natural nanofillers. Um, 
such as carbon nanotubes, um, clays, um, nanocrystalline cellulose, and so on. Uh, this composite can exhibit uh, significant improvements in their mechanical properties um, uh, by the addition of a small amount of nanofillers when compared with conventional materials. Um, well, in particular, uh, laponite is a synthetic ectorite type clay uh, consisting uh, of well-defined platelets uh, with a diameter of uh, 25 to 30 nanometers and a thickness of approximately one nanometer. Like most uh, natural clays, laponite forms face-to-face uh, -face stack uh, layer structures of elementary disk uh, crystals. Well, polymer clay nanocomposite samples uh, were prepared using a high-performance polyester thermoplastic uh, uh, polyurethane um, TPU. Um, and commercial laponite clay was uh, used as the nanofiller material. Uh, the content of uh, the laponite uh, fillers range between uh, 0 0.5 uh, to 10 percent uh, for each manufactured nanocomposite. To synthesize the nanocomposite samples, the solvent solution mixes mixing process was used, uh, which um, which included magnetic steering and ultrasound uh, mixing. Um, well, anyway, uh, this is very important how we synthesize uh, the material. So if you want uh, to see the details of uh, the preparation that uh, can be uh, seen in the paper. Um, uh, well, all resulti resulting samples were uh, very flexible and semi-transparent and impervious to airflow. Um, in addition, samples that had air microbubbles uh, were discarded for the experiment. Uh, well, um, a dynamic mechanical analyzer uh, was used to characterize um, the mechanical behavior of the nanocomposite at different temperatures. Um, also, micrograph images of nanocomposite samples were obtained using a scanning electron microscope. And, uh, well, of course, the dynamic stiffness of each composite was measured uh, according to the standard uh, ISO 9052, which uh, we discussed a few minutes ago. Um, however, in this case, we use a model hammer uh, as the impact source. So instead of uh, electrodynamic shaker, we use the model hammer, which is uh, also valid. Uh, well, this figure shows the experimental results obtained by the DMA. Um, typical curves were observed for the pristine uh, TPU elastomers, uh, in which, due the, to the thermoplastic nature of the matrix, uh, composites soften uh, when heated and become more fluid as heating continues. Uh, since uh, 23 Celsius degrees, temperature much above the glass transition temperature of the uh, use uh, TPU, um, the polymer acts in a rubbery manner, uh, displaying large and fully reversible strains in response to applied stress. Uh, that's um, all the composite exhibited the rubbery plateau uh, region in the static temperature range. Um, in general, mechanical damping increase as the laponite uh, filler contents uh, increase over this rubbery plateau. And as a consequence, the viscoelastic properties of the TPU laponite composites uh, would be appropriate for the composites to be used at typical room temperatures. Uh, obviously, this is not true for more demanding uses such as uh, aerospace application, where we need to uh, probably work with uh, very high temperatures, for example, or very low temperatures as well. Uh, well, at room temperature, uh, laponite uh, laponite fi fi filler uh, at 5 and 10 percent concentrations uh, show the uh, highest damping values. Well, this figure shows the SEM uh, observation of a, a pure polyurethane and uh, a nanocomposite uh, containing 10 percent of laponite. 
Uh, we observed that the further increase in the fillers uh, seems to cause their agglomeration in the polymer matrix, uh, which is supported uh, by this figure. Um, this figure uh, displays a smooth surface compared with uh, this figure, where cluster uh, of aggregated stack elementary disk particles are visible uh, for a high laponite uh, weight load. Um, it has been stated that in these cases, agglomeration may be responsible for the observed increase in mechanical damping as a result of two mechanisms. Um, first is a particle-particle friction or a particle-polymer friction uh, where there is essentially no addition at the interface. Well, these are the results, average results of the dynamic stiffness uh, measured in a layer of a nominal thickness of 3.5 millimeters of the nanocomposite made of uh, a TPU, thermoplastic polyurethane, uh, with different amounts of laponite uh, filler content. Um, the measured dynamic stiffness of the uh, pure uh, polyurethane was 18.67 um, meganewtons per cubic meter. Um, we noticed that the nanocomposite with five and 10% uh, of laponite filler uh, report the lowest dynamic stiffness of uh, eight and five uh, meganewtons per cubic meter, respectively. Um, therefore, the obvious question is uh, whether we can keep reducing the value of uh, dynamic stiffness uh, by adding more and more amount of uh, nanofiller. Is that possible? Well, it's not possible. Evidently, uh, the answer is not. We cannot. Um, although one could be tempted to increase the filler content further than 10% to increase the acoustic performance, it was observed that manufacturer samples of uh, polyurethane that contain amounts of laponite in excess of about 10% become, um, become dark and inelastic, uh, very brittle and breakable and at small deformations, uh, consequently making them uh, useless as impact sound insulation layers. Uh, this change in elastic properties has also been observed in, in polyurethane filled with uh, modified clay and in rubbers filled with, uh, let's say, silica nanoparticle, for example. From the uh, SEM observation shown in the figure, um, it can be uh, that samples containing more than 10% laponite exhibit uh, distinctive agglomeration and a larger cracks. Um, uh, this results in weak uh, binding of nanoparticles with the polyurethane matrix. Well, now I will show uh, some results of a study carried out in our lab, this, this second example, uh, which is under review in a journal. Uh, which is the case of uh, a thin lightweight laminate floor. Um, well, since its uh, development in Sweden at the end of the 1970s, a laminate uh, flooring has become one of the most common floor surfaces in many countries. Uh, it's not only used in new dwellings and modern concrete multi-story buildings, but also to replace allergy causing carpeted floors. Um, however, uh, the improvement in impact sound insulation of uh, this uh, uh, lightweight laminated floors uh, has not received much attention in, in the literature. Every laminate floor must be placed uh, under an underlayment layer, so the floor rests on top of it. This underlayment helps to level possible minor imperfections of the subfloor uh, slab, which may damage the laminate. Um, but also acting as a thermal uh, insulator as well as to stop moisture. Um, well, mo <clears throat> more recently, uh, many thin underlayment layers uh, with thicknesses in the range of two to four millimeters are marketed as uh, sound insulation materials, uh, although few of them provide technical evidence about this property. Um, 
Well, this study was aimed to report the improvement in impact sound insulation of a typical laminated floor resting on different commercially available thin underlayment materials um, above a concrete uh, structural slab. Well, we used a total of uh, 13 commercially available resilient materials, uh, which are commonly used on the floating floors in dwellings, uh, where um, they were selected to have a thickness of three millimeters each, uh, except one that uh, had a thickness of uh, two millimeter. Um, among the materials considered uh, are polymers, uh, such as polyethylene, polypropylene, and polyvinylethylene acetate, which is usually, com a, usually called EVA. Um, also, we have natural, uh, such so as sheep wool, cork, and wood fiber. Um, and also we have recycled materials, uh, such as recycled rubber, uh, recycled textile fibers, and a blend of recycled um, uh, rubber and agglomerated core, which is uh, this uh, RUB. Um, well, this table shows uh, some of the properties of these layers in terms of uh, thickness, uh, density, uh, the hardness, and, and also a relative cost of each one uh, solution. We can see that this is the cheapest the low density expand uh, polyethylene. Um, the more expensive is the recycled rubber and also the cork, natural cork. Well, uh, a 10 millimeter thick high traffic laminate floor uh, was uh, chosen as the floating floor uh, upper layer in this uh, study. Um, the edges of the laminate planks uh, had a tight fitting tongue and groove profile, which allowed the glue free connection between them. The total mass of the per unit area of the laminate was eight. Uh, 8.7, 8 8.68 8 kilograms per uh, square meter, uh, which corresponded to a static load of, of approximately 86 Pascal. Um, after mounting all the samples in sequence in the standardized laboratory at the same conditions, uh, the results of improvement in impact sound insulation were measured, as well as the single number ratings uh, according to the ISO standards. Um, well, the floating floor uh, has 2.44 meter wide and 4.14 meter long, uh, which uh, results in a total surface of about 10 uh, square meters. Well, this slide uh, shows the experimental results of Delta L. Um, it is seen that at least at the uh, 315 Hertz, um, there is very little difference in the delta L measure for all the underlayment materials. Um, we noticed that below this frequency, the improvement is very small, and in some cases, uh, negative isolation values were, were recorded. Uh, above this uh, frequency, the improvement increases with the frequency with an asymptotic slope, which depends on the material used as the layer. Uh, this improvement in impact sound insulation varied initially from between 12 to 15 decibels per octave. octave. Uh, we observed that the underlayments made of uh, wool, cheap wool, and recycled textiles uh, exhibited the highest values of delta L uh, above the 315 hertz, one third octave band. You can see the results here. Uh, although the recycled rubber uh, layer is the most expensive, uh, it did not exhibit significantly better results of delta L that, than the polymer underlayments, except at very high frequencies, above, uh, let's say, two kilohertz. Uh, we get uh, good results with the recycled rubber. Uh, all the other um, uh, materials um, keep almost the same result, and uh, the EVA uh, layer was the worst uh, in, in all the cases. Um, 
In addition, we measured the dynamic stiffness and damping loss factor for each material uh, according to the ISO standard. And uh, then we calculated the single number rating uh, for each floating floor. Um, and the results of uh, resonance frequency, dynamic stiffness, uh, loss factor, and the single uh, number ratings are presented in this table. Uh, important to notice that although visible differences exist in, um, in the corpse of delta L as a function of frequency, the weight normalized impact sound pressure level, that's L and W, were practically the same for all the floating floors um, that gave between um, um, 59 to 60 and uh, 17 to 18 uh, in terms of this uh, single number ratings. This can be explained by the fact that the ISO procedure is aimed mainly at the normalized uh, impact sound pressure levels at low frequencies. Uh, a frequency range where all the floating floor tested in this study exhibited low impact sound insulation. Um, we can see that uh, the underlayments uh, made of uh, ship wool and recycled textile uh, presented the lowest values of dynamic stiffness, um, less than uh, um, we have here less than um, 80 meganewtons per cubic meter. Um, and also they reported the highest loss factors, <clears throat> greater than 0 0.34. Uh, this agrees with the measurement um, we obtained for Delta L that uh, we saw in the previous uh, slide. Well, however, uh, the direct application of the constitute model for estimating the improvement in impact sound insulation doesn't work in this case. Uh, in fact, the constitutive model um, significantly underestimated the delta L of these floating floors when compared with laboratory measurements. The disagreement could arise because uh, the dynamic stiffness values of the thin elastic layers were measured using the static load of a uh, standardized heavy steel plate. Uh, so that means the 2000 Pascal, which is not comparable with the significantly less static load produced by the, the like upper laminate floor, which is 86 Pascal. Uh, it is thought that the non-linearities of the resilient layer could be important to consider in this case. Um, in an attempt to consider the non-linear effects of the thin viscoelastic layer, a, a correction term is introduced in the dominant term of the constitute model. So that means here, this correction terms is defined as uh, this um, a function of the dynamic stiffness per unit area, S, uh, measured with the heavy static load and is given by um, this uh, complete equation uh, where A and B are a known constant and S naught is a reference to dynamic stiffness. In this case, we use one mega Newton per cubic meter. Um, that's just to make uh, delta a dimensionless uh, function. Um, these results in a new empirical equation, which is given here um, in the red frame box, which is a multivariable function and the constant uh, A and B uh, are to be determined by comparing the experimental results of delta L with the theoretical ones, uh, delta L prime uh, predicted by this equation. So the process is uh, that we need uh, uh, to determine the constants A and B that best fit the experimental results uh, by the minimization of a quadratic error function defined by this uh, uh, equation, where N is the total number of tested frequencies. Uh, so minimization of the error function requires solving numerically this system of nonlinear equations. Um, the nonlinear optimi optimization was performed uh, using the Nelder Med uh, simplex uh, method. Uh, that's the best fitting coefficients calculated through the optimization process were substituted into equation for delta, which gave us uh, this final expression. Uh, further analysis show that the predicted values of delta L using this numerical approach um, it's valid for frequencies greater than uh, frequency F1 
which is given by this equation. Um, then this slide shows a comparison between the experimental delta L values um, that are represented here in the values in the black squares um, for the different underlayments as a function of frequency and, and those determined from the empirical formula presented in the previous slide. So that corresponds to the dotted uh, discontinuous uh, blue line. Uh, the agreement seems to be fairly good. Uh, the calculated fits best fitting coefficients um, accurately predict the delta L of the floating floors in a broad uh, frequency range. Um, although some discrepancies uh, are observed at very high frequencies, uh, we think that this formula could be used as a guide to estimate the insulation uh, to impact sound uh, provided by this popular type of flooring. Uh, using the standardized measure dynamic stiffness uh, of the thin uh, recipient layer. Well, and um, finally, to conclude my presentation, I would like to stress uh, the following points. Um, uh, first of all, even though floating floors were introduced uh, almost a century ago, uh, this is the most uh, a viable current alternative to isolate the impact sound in buildings. Um, in buildings, if flanking transmission uh, in the walls uh, is not controlled, uh, this these improvements may not be achieved. Um, the use of environmentally friendly materials as constitutive uh, parts of a floating floor is highly recommended. Uh, the fibrous resilient layers presented uh, in the second study uh, reported the best performance. Um, although these materials can be more costly than some polymeric materials, uh, they have environmental benefits. Uh, for example, several credits can potentially be claimed with the use of these underlayments in register um, deed uh, projects. Um, well, research on high performance uh, viscoelastic materials is uh, clearly an interesting subject for further improvement of noise uh, isolation. And um, um, well, last but not least, it is important to notice that consideration to noise and vibration insulation during the design and building stages is by far uh, less expensive than taking corrective actions. Um, uh, once the building is, is constructed. So, well, that's it, my presentation. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and I will be more than happy to address uh, any questions you may have.